Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. Please subscribe now to get the latest ancient history news and independent research from around the world. For me, Saxe Hulman has been a strong line of research for the past couple of weeks and as I continue to dig deeper into this ancient enigma, the more I'm being blown away. Saxe Hulman is quickly becoming my very favourite ancient architectural wonder. There really is something about it that sets it apart from everywhere else. It's apparently a religious military construction, a site of water management, wells, springs, reservoirs and irrigation. It's a site of incredible stonework and mind-boggling feats of engineering. Easily one of the most elaborate constructions in human history. The earliest Spaniards saw it as a fortress, mainly because of the huge walls that would have been seen as defensive to the Europeans. But chronicler Pedro Cesar de Leon saw it differently, noting that it was a house of the sun with a clear ceremonial and religious function. He saw the military aspect being mainly symbolic and it's possible that ritual battles took place here. This week I've been looking through the earliest sources available from the Spanish chroniclers of the 16th century. But then I also discovered the original archaeological excavation reports from the 1930s. The findings are really fascinating, and I've come to realise that so much important information, as well as the opinions of the lead excavator, have been lost through time. Make sure you stick around for the second half of this video, as I pick out some key points from the earliest archaeological reports, and also show you some fascinating rare photographs, many of which haven't been seen for 90 years. I do feel it's important that I bring this information and the associated old photographs back to light, to make them accessible to a wider audience, so we can all learn something and try and take the subject forward in the 21st century. For now, I'll start at the beginning with the earliest description of Saxe Hulman, and this comes from Pedro Sancho, the secretary of Francisco Pizarro, as he paints a truly incredible picture. He says, There is a very beautiful fortress of earth and stone with big windows that look out over the city, and make it appear more beautiful. In it there are many chambers and a main round tower in the centre, made with four and five storeys, one on each other. The rooms and habitations inside are small, and the stones of which it is made are very well worked and so well placed next to each other that it seems they do not have any mortar, and the stones are so smooth that they seem to be prepared boards with the junctures against each other like that used in Spain. There are so many habitations and the tower that one person cannot see it all in one day and many Spaniards who have seen it, who have been in Lombardy and other foreign kingdoms, say they have not seen another construction like this fortress, nor a more powerful castle. 5,000 Spaniards might be able to fit inside. It can't be attacked or undermined because it is located on an outcrop. On the side facing the city, there is only one wall on a rugged mountain slope. On the other side, which is less steep, there are three one higher than the other. These walls are the most beautiful thing that can be seen of all the constructions in that land. This is because they are of such big stones that no one who sees them would say that they have been placed there by the hand of man. They are as big as pieces of mountains or crags, and they are some 30 palms high and others as wide, and others 25 palms and others 15, but none of them are so small that three carts could carry them. These stones are not flat but very well worked and fit together. The Spaniards who see them say that neither the Bridge of Segovia nor other constructions of Hercules or the Romans are as magnificent as this. The city of Tarragona has some works in its walls made in this way, but they are not as strong or with such big stones. These walls have curved, so that if one attacks them, one cannot go frontally, but rather obliquely with the exterior. These walls are of a similar stone, and from wall to wall, there is so much earth fill that three carts cannot pass on top. The walls are made in the form of three levels, and one begins where the other ends, and another begins where the last one ended. 
This entire fortress was a great storehouse of arms, clubs, lances, bows, arrows, axes and shields, heavy jackets of quilted cotton and other weapons of different types. And there was clothing for soldiers, all collected here from all areas of land subject to the lords of Cusco. There were also many pigments, blues, yellows, browns and others for painting. There was cloth and much tin and lead and other metals, and much silver and some gold. So, that's the end of the quotation and he certainly paints quite a scene, starting by describing the buildings on top of the hill with windows that look down onto Cusco. Buildings that have been dismantled and destroyed, the stone used by the Spanish. He describes the large central tower, but another chronicler, Pedro Pizarro, mentions there are in fact two tall buildings. Cesar de Leon also said there were two, but one was larger than the other. Others say there were three towers, with the round one being the largest. Pizarro also mentions there were guards who looked after the stored materials, including a large supply of tightly woven cane helmets and a set of litters for carrying around the Lords of the Empire. Stones used to make Saxe Woman are of course amongst the largest of any Inca site, but reports vary as to which king was responsible for its construction. Pachacuti and Thupiupanqui are names usually cited by chroniclers and scholars, and the 16th century Spanish landowner, friar, priest and bishop, Bartolom Las Casas, as well as Cesar de Leon, say the site was never completed, an opinion that seems to be confirmed by the study of Jean-Pierre Protzen in the 1980s. Another chronicler, Gosalasso de la Vega, said the site took 50 years to construct but was never finished. How it was built has always been a mystery. Chronicler Gutierrez said stones were pulled into place using ropes made of vine and hemp. This is probably because the Spanish soldier Diego de Trujillo saw large buildings full of ropes, some as thick as a leg, and said they were used to pull stones to make buildings. But according to John Hislop's book on Inca settlement planning, the great secret of the construction of Sacsayhuaman is not ropes or a mysterious technical practice, but rather the rotation of the labour supply, which provided the enormous energies that were needed to erect the walls and the buildings. According to Cesar de Leon, Inca Pachacuti ordered 20,000 men to be sent in from the provinces, and the villages had to supply the men with food. If one got sick, another was sent to replace them, so that person could be sent home and the work was not stalled. He states that these 20,000 men were not permanently engaged in the work, but only for a limited time. As workers left, others came, so that work did not become onerous. He says, 4,000 men quarried and cut stone, 6,000 hauled them with great cables of leather and hemp, Others dug ditches and laid foundations, whilst others cut poles and beams for the timbers. These people lived in separate groups, each with those from their own region, next to the site they were working on. Overseers went around watching what they did, as well as master masons who were highly skilled in their work. There is no actual evidence that Sacsayhuaman was ever used as a fortress, except of course during the Siege of Cusco in 1535 when the Spanish occupied the region. Therefore, the role of the monument is still unclear today, but most say it had some religious ceremonial function as well as being a place for storage. It obviously did have a religious function, but I also think its major importance was water, feeding the surrounding lands and the city, which I've been discussing in recent videos. Even though it was pretty much connected to Cusco, some believe that Sacsayhuaman was an Inca city in its own right. So, that's some background, and it's important to understand how it looked and was perceived by the earliest Spanish conquistadors and chroniclers but I had also been looking for the earliest archaeological reports on the site as well, because that would take this study to the next level. After much digging, I came across the work of Louis E. Valcassel, who was on site in the 1930s excavating Sacsayhuaman, as well as the area to the north where we find the Cocachincarnas Basin. He calls this region Satuna. 
Today, these reports are pretty much lost on an obscure website and are then further lost inside three to 400 page journals about South American archaeology. Being a Peruvian historian, Valcacel also wrote the papers in Spanish. So for me who isn't multilingual, they're not the easiest to search and translate. The spelling of Sacsayhuaman is also different. The file size was also so big that I had to cut the documents into chunks, upload each segment to Google Translate, and then and only then could I read the earliest archaeological reports on Sacsayhuaman. And well, I have to say they are amazing. For the rest of this video I'll give you some of the key points to take home, but for me what was so fascinating was that in the 1930s, Valcacel came to a number of conclusions based on field observations that line up with my own independent work that I've been presenting in the past few videos. And that's the importance of water, the recent destruction, and how the different types of stonework are all likely part of one project, not by three different cultures that are separated by hundreds or thousands of years. It seems the first cleanup operation at the site began at the end of 1933 and early 1934. Valcacel describes Saxe Man as a complete ruin, as shown in this incredible picture. I have a picture of the same section of stonework as it appears today, and if you compare them side by side, you can really see the poor state it was in in the 1930s. I can't cover all the information given, as there are so many pages of information, measurements, sketches and images, but he first pays close attention to the structures on the top of Sacsayhuaman Hill after discovering the foundations of great towers and canals, and these provided water to all areas of Sacsayhuaman. He found Inca ceramics and also copper and silver objects. He also found a broken case that was cut into a quartz block with six cylindrical compartments drilled into it. Each compartment contained a powder of different colours, two of which were intact with their entire contents. These colours were the famous Inca dyes. Now, this large central feature on top of Sacsayhuaman Hill, he says is undoubtedly a reservoir, a source of very pure water, which was also referred to by the chronicler Gosalasso de la Vega. De la Vega said that this water was brought from far below ground, and the Inca could not say where it was from, because these things were kept secret. He also said that kings lodged inside the tower in their own compartments, and that the walls were adorned with gold and silver, and decorated with animals, birds and plants. From this reservoir or water tower, various channels distributed water to other buildings of Sacsayhuaman. These aqueducts followed an intriguing system with a series of settling wells, vertical conduits, curves and jumps. He believed there was some industrial purpose behind it. He explained he could see how the water got out of the central tower, but he doesn't know how it got in, in a structure at the very top of the hill. Either there is some incredible engineering bringing water from afar, or there was a natural spring at this location. This man-made reservoir is estimated to have had a capacity of 47,000 litres of water. He next looked at another tower on the hill, not circular like the main one, but square. He says that this too was endowed with water through exquisite stone channels underground, and communicated with a large central tower via passageways and stairs. There is apparently a third tower as well, but at the time it was unexcavated. He states that all the exposed walls of these features are made with a regular shaped stone with perfect joints, what I call the watertight masonry in my previous videos. It was masonry with a function, and the Spanish took the masonry from Sacsayhuaman Hill and used it for building projects in Cusco. The author says that this stonework was used because the Spanish wanted to keep the new projects in line with the original Inca architectural style. This was interesting because it means that some of the polygonal masonry walls in Cusco could be of Spanish origin, if the Spanish removed the stones from Sacsayhuaman in a systematic way and restacked them in the city. In my last video I also stated that the different types of masonry at Sacsayhuaman, whether field stone stacking or polygonal walls with large or small stones, could all be the work of one culture different stones for different uses, and doesn't have to imply that we see the work of different cultures. 
After excavating, analysing and detailing the architecture of Sacsayhuaman all the way down to below the foundations, Valcacel also came to the same conclusion. He says, it was common for the Incas to use different types of material and masonry for the same building. He says that superficial observers interpret the phenomenon as evidence for work during different times by different cultures, which follow one another, marking thousands of years of separation between one and the other. He says the rediscovery of Sacsayhuaman does debunk these assumptions. I guess if he has excavated this site foundation levels and below, observing the relationships between stones and their functions, he is probably better educated than anyone to make this assertion, even if it is just his opinion. The whole site is carefully and meticulously planned. He notes protective flooring in various places to prevent leaks and also to stop water damaging the structure. He states that in the rainy season, this protective paving would have been an extremely important feature. There are also thick layers of gravel added to the floors on the platforms between the main outer walls and this was done to protect them from the weather. This is a gravel lined alleyway between two perimeter walls lined on either side with polygonal masonry. We also know that the entire hill of Sacsayhuaman was designed to allow the systematic drainage of excess water from the top down. There is a master plan to this entire site and I do believe it really is one construction project. As we can see from this amazing picture, Sacsayhuaman was in a far worse state than we see today. Many of the blocks in the polygonal walls have been carefully put back together in the 1930s. So much so that you can't really tell what's a repair job and what's original, since the blocks fit together so well. This stonework we can see here is modern renovation work, laid hundreds of years after the Inca period and this was done to tidy up the site. You can see it all along the walls of Sacsayhuaman. This is shown when you compare the 1930s image with the modern one side by side. You can clearly see where the walls have been built up recently with inferior stone, to stop soil creeping down the hill to protect the site and make it safe for tourists. As stated, the polygonal megalithic walls were found with much destruction in the 1930s, with many large blocks on the ground. The large stones in the backfill behind the walls could be because the modern restorers didn't know where the polygonal wall block went during restoration. The fact is, if you look at the walls of this structure today, you are looking at how it was restored in the 1930s. I know there is a lot of information in this video, but I think it is extremely helpful to understand the site. Valcacel next goes on to explain the area around Cocachincanus, and this really is the icing on the cake because he gives so much information about how this site really was all about water, just like I said in my previous videos. Again, I'll give you a brief overview. He names the region the Satuna sector of Sacsayhuaman. The type of masonry and hence the age of construction at this location is very similar to the main Sacsayhuaman site but it differs in that the bastions follow the irregular projections of the rock. On uncovering the archaeology on this side of Sacsayhuaman, Valcacel concludes that this region as a whole is without doubt another Inca city. He described the amphitheatre-like Cocachincanus Basin with its three overlapping circles and says that beyond the top one are enormous structures or rooms. In this region he notes the strong association with water, calling it a hydraulic system with canals and pools distributed on different plains, eventually discharging into a large pond. We now know that with further excavation this channel was discovered, draining the water from this region into the large Cocachincanus reservoir. He also mentions there is an opening to the Chincana or underground labyrinth, which I think are subterranean water channels. At the time though, these were unexplored. To the southeast of Cocachincanus, Valcasol noted small rooms, channels, retaining walls or terraces, and also a fountain, aka the source of a natural spring. This confirms my suspicion that this outcrop of limestone rock was also the site of a spring. He calls this region the Inca Baths, with a series of carved seats, platforms and so on, and he notes pools or wells inside the massive limestone, as well as numerous water channels. 
This region, which was the subject of a recent video, he says has the name Devil's Pulpit, which may indicate a significant religious site to the Inca, especially if Spanish Christians gave it such a name. It may also explain why it's been so badly damaged. He explains that at this location, there is a small amphitheatre that receives water from the west, through a channel that previously went through two basins, likely destroyed when the rock was blown up. Across the entire site of Sacsayhuaman, he notes a number of perforations in the stone where he says that explosives were attached. Of course, since the Inca period, this entire site was a quarry, and dynamite and other explosives have been used. So, that's about 60 pages of information that I've condensed into a few minutes of a video, but I wanted to pull out some key points and present them to you, and there really is so much more I could say. What the information in this video shows is that the entire site of Sacsayhuaman, both the north and south sides of the open plain, was strongly connected with water. Water is the key to understanding the importance, function and prominence of Sacsayhuaman, and many of the most important features of this site were clearly built with water in mind. It is a breathtaking construction project, and the whole system of managing the natural groundwater really is the work of master architects. But how old is it? Well, the historical writings, the archaeology, the radiocarbon dating, as well as the level of erosion and the man-made cuts in the limestone, well, it all shows that this is likely a Proto-Inca and Inca project. Maybe started by the Proto-Inca Kilke culture, but maybe with the bulk of the work done by Inca Pachacuti. I can't see much reason to doubt it. Sacsayhuaman really is one of humanity's greatest ever feats of construction. And so, if the Inca did build it, they need to be remembered as master stonemasons, master architects and masters of agriculture and irrigation. And, as we can see, Sacsayhuaman really was their crowning glory. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please like the video, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.